the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are architect Alex Istanbulu and director, literary agent, Michael Peretzian. Architect Alex Istanbulu was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, where he attended the Armenian parochial school. He went on to Le Rouge in Geneva, uh, his boarding school, and then he came to the United States to earn a bachelor and master's degree in architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. Was it formed for you to come to the United States uh, to take classes? Um, I don't think I ever considered anything else. So it was definitely there because was, of boarding school, because of Geneva, was no, it international no, no, it was just, or no, what? No, it was because of just Armenians in Istanbul. You know, as soon as they sort of became got into the middle class, they they would try to send their children out to America as soon as possible. So it was never Is that right? when I was eleven, I knew that that's what I was going to do. There was never even a question about it. But so uh, th that boarding school was like a very fancy boarding school where the royalty sent their kids all exactly. over Europe, right? Did a lot of people from Istanbul send their kids there? Uh, no, there were, um, I think there were two other Turks who were uh, at Le Rose when I was there, and it was totally coincidence that I ended up there. Is that right? Did, did they teach their classes in French? What did uh, it was do? in French and in English. So the first two years I was there, it was all in French, and then I got into the English side. Oh, and then it was in English. So when you came to Chicago, it was just second uh, nature? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> English is my fourth language, but it was, <laughs> I, and I learned English from Americans at, uh, at Rose. So what happened when you got to Chicago? Were you just like, I was odd because the architecture is so great. I was I was odd because I really got into architecture. I got fascinated by it, and I kind of forgot my social life and my Switzerland life and my Istanbul life. And I really got into it. I was fascinated by it, and I was also shocked because IIT is in the South Side ghetto, which is quite a different oh. place than uh, than uh, Geneva. <laughs> so you were, li but but it's changing now, isn't it? it that is area very much changed that, a that lot. That area has changed a lot. You're absolutely right. It's changed, it's changed quite a bit. But I arrived in Chicago literally the week after the 1968 convention, right after Mayor Daley had oh. uh, beaten up the journalists. The city was on fire, and there was lots of uh, just there was a lot of. It so was a where messy did you time. live? You lived on campus. I lived on oh. campus. It was. <laughs> Did you leave campus? I, did, I left campus as often as I could, but I didn't have a car, so uh, and I didn't oh. even know how to drive because I was sort of a relatively innocent European at the time. Oh, that's But there were, I remember that within the first few weeks I was there, the, the townhouses outside, the, uh, there was an eight-foot chain link fence around the school, oh, and there, there were all these, you know, kind of racist white guys on our side of the fence yelling, burn, baby, burn. Oh, no. On the other side of the, ha oh, the fence were, um, were houses burning down. Oh, my gosh. It was awful. So... <laughs> well, they didn't burn any of the good architecture. No, they did. Yeah, the so architecture in Chicago stayed. was fantastic. And, and is that why you chose the institute to go to school? Yes. Because of the architecture? Because of the architecture. And then as you became an architect, or after you got out of school, um, did you stay there to be influenced by what was there? I was. I was sort of pulled into SOM with, uh, from, by one of my faculty members, basically. I did my thesis there. Um, I worked at the Art Institute for did you? seven years while I was going to school. So did you want to be an artist? Uh, no, never. I always wanted to be an architect. Oh, because but I was very much. I was very. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I, uh, I, I was very much influenced by uh, this man, Jim Spire, who was, a, who was an architect by training. But he was uh, the curator of 20th Century Art at the Art Institute. I worked for him for seven years. Oh, and you also did? So you were with a lot of contemporary artists. I mean, yeah. you had the, the um, yeah. uh, interchange with artists who were of your period. Absolutely. For, for, um. for seven years, I, I helped Spire do the exhibitions at the Art Institute, all the contemporary art oh, exhibitions. Oh, you did? Were you hanging? I was hanging stuff. I was doing exhibits so, for seven years. So that was kind of architectural, wasn't it? Because, it was, they because always... you got to see the stuff being made right away. 
You, you made, made the models, you did the drawings, and then it got built. But they like to have architects do the installations, don't they? There's a little separate bent about that. Um, our, the Art Institute, that was not a problem because they chose a curator who was an architect by training. So he sort of got to do it. I didn't, I, you know, Chicago was, was very, very different than L.A. that way. I don't think than L.A., yeah. yeah, but here you were coming from Turkey and Switzerland. Was that an influence as you started working in, with uh, an architecture office? Um, I can't, not that early on, no. I think it that the sort, of, no, the sort of the Turkish European influences really came, came on as I opened my office and started trying uh -huh. to have my own. And, own practice. and when did that happen? When did you op open? When I was about 36, I moved to Los Angeles. I kind of, uh, in, in some ways, exiled myself from Chicago. I felt like I had learned a lot in Chicago, but I needed to find my own voice. And there was an opportunity for me to move to Los Angeles. So did I did. Did you go with the firm? No, uh, actually I did, yeah. They were, yeah I was going to ask you, who they, did you work with before you got your own office? With Skid Mowings and Merrill. Oh, you did? And um, I was kind of on a partnership track in the Chicago office. But oh, you I, started at I started, SOM there, I see. I was pulled into there by another mentor of mine, Myron Goldsmith, who was a wonderful architect. Oh. And he was a partner there, and he pulled me in. I spent a couple of years there, and as soon as they opened the Los Angeles office, I thought that was my opening. Oh. And, I, and that was on the west side, wasn't it? Yeah, it yes, was a couple of different places uh -huh. that moved, moved around. Oh, that's fantastic. So now you have a, a large firm on the west side. I have a firm sides. of my own. It's Santa not, Monica? In Santa Monica, and I've been there. Uh, the firm has been up for 22 years now. Wow. So, um, so tell me, when you go to find an architect to come and work for you, what do you look for? In terms of young architects yes, who are working? For, or any architect I, who comes to work for you. I'm, I always look for somebody who is uh, who has, uh, who is, has kind of keen intelligence and is um, creative. But for me, they have to be organized. And oh, is so that it? They need to be organized because I'm not that organized. So the people who are working with me, are, you know, the ones that I really get along with are, have to be organized and responsible. How can you tell if they're creative? Do they come right out of our, our, um, architecture school to you? They, uh, usually, I, it, it usually doesn't work if they're coming right out of school. Uh, I think there's some people who are in school who, as interns who work for me. Oh, is and that? that has worked out really well. But it's usually best if they've gone off and worked work somewhere else for four oh, or five years. Oh, you'd rather years. have them it's come just, in seasoned. It, 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 it actually is just so much to learn, especially at the early age, oh. early period. And my firm is very small, so it makes it very difficult for us to train people do, early on. Do you uh, work with a certain uh, architecture school? Um, like no. to have interns come no, in? No, I've had people from SciArc. I've had people from Woodbury. I've had lots of people from, I've, right now I have somebody from... Uh, Carnegie. I have a, oh, a really? German woman who's you know studied in Germany, and uh, this uh, other uh, gentleman who studied in San Francisco Institute of Art. So, oh, so I've got a, there's a whole variety of, of people. And everyone does something different. Um, everybody has a specialty. Everybody has their <laughs> specialty. It it's not that they so much that they do something different. They kind of all do the same. They're all project managers and project architects. But um, you know, I have one person who's. Um, kind of able to do the, the bigger commercial projects. I have another oh. person who's much more adept at the housing stuff. Oh, which you and do a lot of. I'm doing a lot of housing. Well, you've done projects all over the world. I noticed Japan, Turkey, Kenya, all over the United States. I have. And, and how is it to work in those different places? It's the creative process, Joan. It's it all matter? the same. It really doesn't matter. It's the, it's the client. And I mean, Japan? It's, it was, Japan was a competition, and it was a wonderful competition. It was one of these things that I wanted to learn a lot from. It was a housing competition, and I got to play out some of the ideas that Corby had started in the 1920s. Oh. And, and, it was, and I got an award for it, and I learned, there's stuff that I learned during that competition I'm still using today. And the project that you saw the, a couple of weeks yes, ago. Yes, in West Hollywood. In West Hollywood, the Sweetser Project is very much kind of a child of that that whole well, you just mentioned Corbusier. Mm -hmm. That uh, was he one of your influences? Absolutely. He was I, when I was actually at uh, in boarding school at Rose. A friend of mine had gotten me a book. It's by this dear dear friend Peter Riva who lived in London. And he brought me back a book on Corbusier, and I ended up doing my final paper, my English thesis on uh, boarding school and high school on uh, Corbusier. So I remember the stuff that I read and I was looking at at the time. Had he done that? house in India Yes. by that time? Because yeah. we stayed yeah. in that house in Ahmedabad. 
Now there is a lucky, lucky lady. I know, lady. isn't that fantastic? <laughs> that is fantastic. But it's the same kind of thing, an architect working all over the world. I would love to talk to you about that house, <laughs> see how well it worked. It worked, With, it was very natural interesting. ventilation and... Uh-huh, yeah. and then uh, there was a, a, a slide that came right. into the pool yeah. in the back. It was very interesting. Wow. Uh, but one of the things uh, in the U.S. that you talked about, that you've just finished, is this underpass, overpass in Arizona. In Tucson, yes. And I saw the photographs of that, and it's so transparent that it's just wonderful. It's great that you would say that. It was, um, there was, a, it was a project that was almost bid. It was not what I did, but engineers had actually done these drawings, two and a half inch thick set of drawings. By the time I got involved with it, and they were actually gonna do another underpass somewhere else, it was very complicated. And we were able to sort of convince them to expand the one that they already had, but make it wider oh. so that it was much more open. And we created this connection, the pedestrian bridge. And we saved the city a lot of money, created extra land, developable land, and it's just open in August and everybody is really happy well, with Well, that's it. what you have to do. That's what you have to look for instead of knocking something down or moving a whole it was a unit much more It was a much more sustainable project. That's we saved yards and yards of earth moving and it's a lot less road construction, a lot more landscaping, and much more developable land. Which is what we should be talking about. And let's talk about the Sweetser project because it's a, you hold it. <laughs> and explain, it's a maisonette. There, there are, what's a maisonette? What's a maisonette? <laughs> Tell maisonette us what this is. is actually a Corby term. Uh, oh, it is? It is. He actually, it was actually, what he was doing was uh, uh, using it as a way to uh, densely occupy agricultural land with a lot of housing to kind of, it was a hybrid, you know, as people were moving from an agrarian society into an urban society, there was need for housing. So it was a hybrid of little houses that were stacked on top of each other. Well, who did that too? The Israeli. Uh, Moshe Safdie yeah, did a, Safdie did a, did a version of that, yes, in Is, Montreal. But he, was he influenced by uh, the same Absolutely, way? I'm sure he was influenced by, by, by yeah, no, that, definitely. And this was sort of in the 80s, 70s, yeah, 80s, right. he, did, he did that stuff. This is a, you know, kind of a different version of Corby's in that they're two-story. Each unit has uh, living rooms downstairs and bedrooms upstairs, or the bedrooms are up, uh, living rooms are upstairs and the bedrooms are downstairs. So it's so two little, stories each? They're each two stories, and they're literally little houses stacked on top. So each one gets air and ventilation coming from three sides and sometimes four sides. Is there a certain kind of material that you use? Um, all of these have to be very cost effective in order for them to really work. So I use the most ordinary materials I can find. Is that right? Yeah, and I just and shape it the spaces. It works. I think that the more important thing is that I have operable windows so there's natural ventilation. When you do something like this, you always, uh, in your bio, it says you, you think about art as far as incorporating things. How do you incorporate art in something like this? It's it's focusing on the livability of each unit. So I never let go of a unit unless I have several ways of laying out furniture in it. So oh, you do? When, when you lay out the furniture, you know where your TV is going to go, and you know where you're going to hang the art, or at least you have an opportunity to do that. But you don't hang art in there because there's too many different tastes, right? Well, no. They're, they're but empty you know units, it's for their... But I know I, if I... If I can walk through the unit and I hang see. my art and use it and have my speakers in the right place, then I've finished designing the unit. If, oh, I, if, I, I, see. if I haven't thought it through to that level, then I haven't completed my task. So that's the livability part it's of livability. it, right? You've yeah. done everything else. What about the gardens? There's little gardens around these. Everywhere. It's a fantastic <laughs> building. What is it, 1,200 suites, sir? It's 1,200 suites, sir. And the units on the lower level have their gardens immediately outside of them. Uh -huh. And the units, there are five of them so around, around the project. And then there are five, which we call the sort of the sky units or the penthouse units. They have the their gardens on the roof. Oh, they have them on the roof. Yeah. So they're, they're, every unit has gardens. Some of them on the roof, and some of them on the ground level. Did the you, bedrooms are in the middle. When you built this, because it's quite a large project, did you go to the city? Did you work with the neighbors? What you have to do? We did. We had to work with the neighbor, neighbors and the city. And West Hollywood was very friendly. I think there's a lot of controversy about it now because the project is done and nobody likes a brand new building. But um, the approvals were very easy. We went through, we, we, and I enjoy the approval process. It's, it's, it's kind of like um, outdoor sculpture. You have to make it friendly to your neighbors, otherwise they don't want it there. You, you do, and this is part of the reason why the massing is so broken up. So uh -huh. this, you know, this is a relatively it's, large it's building. Like little houses. It, exactly. It's built in, it's broken up into three pieces, and then vertically, just like 
Sullivan and other Chicago architects. It's broken <laughs> up into a bottom, a middle, and a top. So there we have you, yes. back to Chicago yes. and those great you can't architects get, You can't there. get Chicago out of me. Before we leave, do you collect art? Absolutely. As much as I can, California, I do. who's your? Um, California, I have a Chuck Arnoldi, and we have a Laddie Dill, and we have, I have a Jasper Johns from many, many, many years ago. Um, all our favorites. So, yeah. All our favorites. And we're glad we that you've become can. part of our favorite, too. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much, Joe. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Michael Peretzian. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with Michael Peretzian, who was born in New York City, raised in New Jersey, and came to Hollywood as a teenager. After Hollywood High in UCLA, where he earned a Bachelor in Motion Picture Production, a secondary teaching credential, a Master's in Theater History, uh, then an MFA in Directing, he went on to teach as an associate pro uh, producer, pro pro professor. professor at the Pasadena Playhouse. If you can believe this, Michael, after all that education, started a new career in the mailroom at CAA and William Morris. Right. Well, you spent 40 years there as a literary agent at William Morris and CAA. And what were you going to talk about? What were you doing this motion picture work and all this uh, secret desire to, to direct? How, where was it all? Well, I, because I was trained in the theater, uh, uh, that's what I thought I was going to do until I saw certain films of that time by Ingmar Bergman and Antonioni and Fellini. And I thought, oh, how powerful, how exciting. Maybe that's what I should do to use my skills in the motion picture business. And it turned out that uh, uh, I was in the mailroom of William Morris and, and saw a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of other trainees who wanted to represent actors, but I wanted to represent writers. Oh, I was that, that the desire? That was that's the where desire. it came, I see. Uh, and that uh, I started that, and seeing at that time Steve McQueen in the hallway was uh, something that wasn't really that impressive because he's short, I thought. And, you know, movie stars are usually shorter than you think they are. But <laughs> so one... we were talking about that today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but one day, uh, uh, a check came to the agency for Steve McQueen, and it represented his second year's profits from the movie Bullet. And they Which said, a great, uh, and film. You, great film. But that check, you should have gone to his accountant, and then the accountant paid the commission to the agency. So they asked me to walk this check 10 blocks down Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills to his accountant. Well, I got one block and I had to look in that envelope and <laughs> saw that it was a check for over $1 million. And here it was in my breast pocket. And I was walking down Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills with a million dollars in my pocket. And then the penny dropped. I, oh, this is what it's about. It's not seeing Steve McQueen in the hallway. It was the potential that your work uh, could really generate that kind of income. So I thought, well, then that's my career. So were you in the mailroom when you did this? Yes, I was in the mailroom. I mean, I did you that. were young. Well, no, this was your second time, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You exactly. weren't a teenager, but no, then. no. But you know, where I was a substitute teaching at Beverly Hills High School, ah. I found myself now in night school taking speed writing classes and learning how to type so that I could become what they call us an assistant, but it's really a secretary to an agent where you learn the craft, you learn the business. By so you just learn from the mailroom to exactly. the secretarial to being like top of the ladder. A uh, literary oh, agent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, well, you were. Well, you were there for a long time. Yes, I was. And and something. How happened. did you choose yeah. to be a literary agent? And well, what does a literary agent do? Well, I think my liberal arts education, you see, I, I really took to heart. So when I read a piece of material that was really literary uh, and and excellent, and I just had my passion for those people who could write like that became so intense that I was able to sell them out of my oh. own passion for the fact that their talent was there and, and that served me very well. But um, did you know those people? Were they personal friends? No. 
No, no they theater, weren't. No, and usually it came through referral and said, so, oh gosh, Michael Peretzian, I have someone's really good and you should know about it. And that's how I developed this cachet for a lot of the, the excellent writers. And, and because a lot of them were playwrights, because my background was a theater. I was going to ask you, yeah. I was able to really uh, uh, use that as well. I was going to ask you about that, because you wanted... Uh, you were working with motion picture people, yes. and then you were working with theater people. So what you were doing, your clients broke down into film, uh, Broadway, books. Did you do uh, uh, like authors other than books? No, I don't really, know. really what I, I tried to do is try to match books with some of my writers and that we could set up and uh, in a development deal at a studio. That's primarily what I did. And I represent the film and television side of their careers, not the play side. That was done by other agents. But when they had a playwright like Beth Henley or Mark Vedoff who really wanted to do film, I was the guy that was going to try to move their career in that direction. So like Terrence McNally that you talked talked about, or Beth, yeah. when they did something on Broadway, then you brought it to the theater the, or exactly. to the movies? Yeah, so I was involved I with, see, like, for see. instance, Crimes of the Heart. When that was done, I was able, part of that was to make a deal for Beth Henley to sell those rights as well as do the screenplay. Oh, I see. And then and um, with books, like Christopher Ham Hampton okay. and I don't know who else. Uh, Christopher Hampton uh, was an agent who, uh, was a writer whose agent had died and I was asked to come into his life and uh, it was after uh, Les Liaisons Dangereuses oh, yeah. uh, for which he won the Academy Award and um, so it wasn't so much uh, getting books sold as much as was getting Christopher Hampton the job to adapt the book. That's, I see. That's so that, that's how, what the, age, the literary agent says. Exactly. Because it's hard to de de decipher yeah. what the jobs are. That's right. There's a literary agent in New York that is a book agent. And then they call them literary agents here in Hollywood. And they are really uh, agents who represent writers uh, who either sell original screenplays or their services to adapt a book into you film. See, that's the difference. Yes. I mean, that's that's a, a kind of a mix-up thing for me. What about Anthony Man uh, Mangala? Anthony Mangala, God bless him. I, I saw uh, his film uh, Truly Madly Deeply and uh, became his agent off of that. And, and it was from that that we developed a very strong and personal relationship. Um, uh, that but for the film, all for films, we're talking about that's what right. you did. That's right. That's and he right. did a lot of films. He did a lot of film, and uh, he won the Academy Award for directing The English Patient, and uh, certainly had the respect of a, so many people working in the business because he was one of those people that proved that quality and commerce are not mutually exclusive concepts. Yes, because you don't you think if you're going to see something commercial, it's going to be not very good. Exactly. And when he did the the uh, talent of Mr. Ripley, mm. and at the opening night party, there are a lot of people, a lot of d directors in Hollywood who came up to him and said, "How did you do this? How did you get <laughs> Paramount to make a film where the murderer?" gets away gets at the away. end. How yeah. did you do that? You know, but that's not an see, easy feat. But they didn't see that it was great writing. Right, right, exactly. Well, I think they, you know, the commercial aspects of it are, are, were something they always had in doubt because a murderer gets away. That's, that's hard to sell in Hollywood. The other, the other thing that when I looked over what you had done and all this, these people that you had worked with in film, but in the beginning, we said you did teach as a professor at Pasadena Playhouse, right, that's right. and that's just solely stage work, isn't it? Right, solely. It was courses in acting, a uh, course in the history of the background to the history of theater, which was like Western Civ, as well as play analysis. That's where I developed that, oh, that. that skill to know how to, what the structure is of dramatic writing. And then um, y you had all these clients, yeah. you were moonlighting as a director. Well, I, <laughs> yes, I was. How can you moonlight as a director well, when you, know, you have to rehearse <laughs> during the day, don't you? Well, this is what happened. I, uh, at one point, things were going so well. I mean, I, was, I had an apartment in the Hollywood Hills. I had a black t Porsche Target in my garage. I mean, things were looking well, except that one Saturday morning, I woke up and felt dead. I mm. felt something is wrong. 
and I did an inventory of my life and remembered, when did you feel, if you did this without any money considerations, you'd be happy? And it was directing for the theater. So I started uh, directing at night. I would leave the office. No one knew this was happening. That's what I wondered. How does a person I, moonlight when well, they've got in the, this big office? Well, it's called 7 to 11, Monday through Friday, <laughs> and all day Saturday and all day Sunday. <laughs> but that's okay, isn't yeah. it, if you're working and doing something you it like? Worked, it worked well. And I, I think that's the lesson oh, for... Oh, so you would leave the office and, and you had your rehearsals at night then instead of during yeah. the day? Like and it was, a big, it was a big secret until the reviews came out in the trades and in the LA Times and the agency wasn't so happy about that like why are you doing this you know but you did make a name for yourself in the directing field and I think one of the things that really came to light was Red Dog Howls yeah. I think I don't know I'd seen your name before known your name but I think that brought it up the premiere of that play. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think that play really, you know, uh, certainly when I decided to make this transition, Alex Dinolaris was one of my clients. And oh. when he found out I was going to do this, he said, Michael, I have a play. You have to do Red Dog Howls. You have to do it in Los Angeles because we want it close to Glendale because there are the Armenians there. So he just got on the phone and talked to his backers and said, Michael Peretzian is going to direct Red Dog Howls with Kathleen Chalfont in Los Angeles. That's, that's because that was your client, so they had the, uh, the um, what, they knew that you could do it, they had, they had faith in you. They did, because of the way I talked about their material. Yes, I talked to them, to, to, their, to, to them about their scripts as a director might, so they knew oh, this guy... You were asking the right questions. Exactly, exactly. And you cared about it. And I cared about it because... My parents both survived the Armenian genocide. None of our families ever t are in Los Angeles. My grandparents were here too, but it, they didn't go through that. But they never talked about exactly. the past. But, but, but in, the, in the play, there's one character who knows something is missing. <laughs> something is different. And he discovers it. And that play spoke so much to me because it was... And it, it just showed, put a light on those things that my Armenian parents Never oh, so that's, wanted to talk about. Well, it was a great success, and I saw it, and I thought it was brilliant. And I didn't know you at the time, but <laughs> okay. now, before we leave, right. I know you're you're directing a Harold Pinter play, yeah. No Man's Land, and I think we want to talk about that. Yeah, of course, yes. So tell us a little this, bit about this that. play. Has haunted me for decades. I first saw it in 1976 with Ralph Richardson and John Gielgud uh, doing it on Broadway. Oh, wow. And then uh, later on, like 15 years later, I saw a production directed by an, a client of mine, David Laveau, in England at the Almeida Theater with Harold Pinter playing the part of Hearst in the cast. Oh, he wrote it and played, him, uh, played exactly. in his play. So this play has been hovering over me. And it, of course, it's trying to figure out this play. It's very mysterious because what the play is about is not what the actors are talking about. So it's all about what is not said. Oh, right. And um, it's been quite a difficult process, but intriguing one in terms of trying to figure it out. And is when it I directed differently each time it's directed? Yeah, I think it has been, mm. you know. And each time, it's kind of like when I saw it originally, I was trying to figure it out. I just knew, gosh, I don't know what this play is about, but it just moved me so oh. in some way below the neck. And then when I saw Harold Pinter do it, again, I was asking these same questions, but I was 15 years older. There were different questions. Oh. And then I realized maybe the play is about, since it's so ex 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 existential, uh, and he was influenced by Samuel Beckett, maybe we're all kind of in our own no man's land that between birth and death, we are stuck in a world that's icy and silent in space, trying to figure it out whether it's religion or tradition or something, why are we here and who put us here and what are we supposed to be doing? Yeah, and so that's the, what he reflects in his writing and that's what you have to bring out in your characters. Did you cast it? Yes, uh, with Alan Mandel and Larry Pressman and two young actors, John Sloan and Jamie Donovan. And they have, do, do they ha see eye to eye with you? Well, we did. We, there were lots of times where rehearsal was discussing what are we doing here and what, you know, what, on that level, what are we, what is our objectives and what are we trying to accomplish? And then the, the metaphysical aspects will become apparent, but not, you can't play that. But What are we doing yes, here? Yes, exactly. That's what Mitch Album in his new book was talking about. You know, we're all here and we all have the same thing. And what are our beliefs? 
and that's all we can take with us. <laughs> that's all right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of metaphysical. I mean, what do we have? He said the person opened his hand, and this is all he has when he dies. Yes, exactly. So I think what you're saying is really eerie, but it's true, isn't well, it? It's it something we have to address. Well, you've been like a pop star, Michael. You've just reinvented yourself, and you keep reinventing yourself over and over, don't you? Well, we're trying. <laughs> Where we're do trying. we go next? Uh, Thank you for, for, for saying that. I, no, I, but you are. And I think the LA Drama Critics gave you a Best Director Award for A Life, A yeah. Life. Yes. And did that have anything, was it anything like this Pinter play? <clears throat> no, A Life was, again, all of these plays that move me and the plays I want to direct are ones of what, how should we live? Yeah. What is important? What is really important? Mingela's radio play may be something I may want to do called Cigarettes and Chocolate. And uh -huh. it sort of ends, what is really important? And I think any great work of art, whether it's visual or theater or music, when a great work of art is effective, it stops you from your life to really think about that moment. And when you come off that moment, you may be make some changes about attitudes, if not actions, about how you should live. And that's how you want your audience to go away, yeah, with that it. moment. And a life has had that. That's why I loved that play so yeah. much. Well, I thank you for coming today. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> this has been great. I've, I've had so much fun with it today. <laughs> thank you very much, well, Michael. Thanks. And keep writing. Uh, my email is the best, jaquin1 at AOL, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N one at AOL.com and 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.